Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of our Beatles program called Things We Said Today. This is our weekly podcast concerning what's going on in Beatle news. I'm Ken Michaels, host of the syndicated radio program on the Beatles called Every Little Thing, and I'm joined by Mr. Beatles examiner, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. On today's show, we're going to be talking about a new DVD that just came out from director Seth Swirsky, and it's called Beatles Stories. And uh, you want to tell the folks listening what this DVD is all about? Well, the title pretty much gives it away. It's uh, a lot of people talking about encounters with the Beatles, either as a group or separately. Not all of them are famous. Some of them are just fans. And it's, uh, you know, it's an idea. It's one of those things, well, why didn't I think of that kind of thing? But he did, and he's got, you know, there there are just a, a lot of people in there. There's, Like I said, there's a lot of names that you'll recognize, or some you won't, some you might not expect. Um, but it, it's interesting that he was able to get them all together and to get them to uh, respond. Um, it took him, you know, a number of years to do this. And um, he told me when I interviewed him that he said he usually asked people for 10 minutes and they gave him two hours. Mm. But uh, it's an interesting film. I mean, and, you know, you've seen there's many unauthorized Beatle films that have come out over the years. And, you know, you've seen, I'm sure, everybody's, I'm sure, seen at least one. And there's, you know, a lot of films with people giving, you know, st- telling stories about them. But this one has, is just has a different, charm to it it's it's a it's it's a lot of fun it's it's very enjoyable i gotta tell you the first time i even heard about this film i was kind of blasé about it and i was thinking so so what's the big deal a bunch of people tell you stories about the beatles but i was so pleasantly surprised when i watched this thing and part of the reason why and you were just saying there are famous people and not so famous people you have people from every walk of life talking about the Beatles in this film. It could be people who are actors, people who are musicians, people who work with the Beatles, just about anybody. A girlfriend, George Harrison's girlfriend, is in, mm-hmm. uh, uh, or is, is in this film. You know, everyone to uh, a girl who was in Apple Scruff, <laughs> who hung out, hung out outside Abbey Road Studios. You know, right. every type of person is interviewed in, in this film, And they've all got their stories to tell. And for people who think sometimes, and it's it's very easy to think this way, everything that's ever been said about the Beatles has been said already. Well, that's certainly not the case. I mean, there's so many people who have had an experience with them that we don't even know about. And what I really love most about this film is that you do have all these different types of people. Think about people in the music industry in particular that probably met them met one of them, met all four of them, who have never told their story. Maybe they're right. people that you think probably hung out with the Beatles. You never hear about them. There's one little bit in there, just as an example, Justin Hayward of the Moody Blues is in there. That's someone that I kind of always wished had collaborated with you know, one or more of the Beatles. I love the Moody Blues. I love his work. And there's a story in there about how he got together with Donovan and George Harrison, and they jammed together. There's some really charming stories in there, and the and the really I think the real attraction to it is that you're right about you know you write about the famous people in there, but both the famous and the and the not so famous have the same kind of joy and enthusiasm about the stories. It's not you know usually in these kind of uh, unauthorized documentaries, the people who know them just kind of retell the same stories over again. There's kind of a you know, a big deal type of thing. But everybody, there's there's a there's a mood that really is is all through this this DVD, this documentary. That's just really nice. It's just really uplifting. Mm. I think that's the word, uplifting. That's the wonderful thing. That's what really works with this thing. And, and um, also, I think the fact that these stories, for the most part, are fresh. These are right. stories that we haven't heard before. And I got to tell you one thing: the the people who are not as famous or somewhat famous there's a lot of people here that you wouldn't even think in your wildest dreams would be in this film to give you an example this film starts with a comedy team of mitzi mccall and charlie brill 
<laughs> I mean, what a way to start this film. Those two were on the Ed Sullivan show on February 9th with the Beatles. So they're talking mm -hmm. about what the experience was like. I mean, to start the film with that, I mean, how many, uh, where else would you even find? I mean, I, I, I give credit to Seth Swirsky for this, to even think about, and actually it would make a very good documentary if you can manage to find all the people still alive that were on the Ed Sullivan shows when the Beatles were on to talk about what it was like. But to start with that, I mean, you wouldn't even think about those two people. Right. Right, and and some of the and and, and you know we're not going to give away. You really have to see the film to enjoy it. But there's some really, really beautiful stories in there that you would not expect. I won't tell the story, but one of the highlights for me was the Jimmy Pugh story. That was very interesting, and of course Brian Wilson talking. And, well, a uh, lot of people may not know who Jimmy Pugh is, so he uh, plays George Harrison in um, 1964, and. Um, I mean, he's a Beals impersonator, and his story is is very cool. Um, and I, I won't go any further. Well, you, you can we can we can go into detail on a few stories. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. I mean, this is one that that you almost don't want to say too much about because it's such a beautiful story. Is he meets up with George Martin, and um, so George they, Martin they, gets to see one of their shows, right? And imagine what it's like when you're impersonating one of the Beatles and George Martin's in the audience. Right. And, and actually, why would George Martin, who's lived through it, who worked with those four people, why would he want to go and see a band impersonating the Beatles? Mm -hmm. I know that that was kind of a mind blower, actually. Right. That, that he would even be there, you know. There's moments like that all the way through that you don't expect. Um, and... They're just, it's just fantastic. Uh, Davy Jones is another one that's in there that actually, you know, given what has happened to Davy Jones, uh, you know, that he's passed on, mm. it's really a tender moment. But it's nice to see Davy Jones in there. Um, actually, there are several people who recently passed away that are in here. Right. Norman they, Smith, also Victor Spinetti. And, and yeah. as a matter of fact, with Norman Smith, there's a bonus track. There are several bonus tracks on the DVD, and there's a lengthy interview with Norman Smith, which I think is wonderful. I and mean, he's one of those people who, as you learn more and more about, as you study the engineers, you want to know more about them. And I'm very grateful that in recent years, we've had people like Jeff Emmerich put out a book, and now Ken Scott has put out a book. Uh, Norman Smith put out a book several years ago, which I believe only the Fest for Beatle fans released it. But there haven't been many interviews with him where he talks at length about the Beatles. You can find some things online, but there really isn't a lot. So there's actually a story in there, and I won't give it all away, but in the bonus track, he was talking about how when the Beatles recorded Please Please Me, since the Beatles had already been turned down by all the other uh, record companies in England, most notably Decca, that they made an acetate of Please Please Me, and they sent it to Decca before the Beatles released it, just to find out what their reaction would be. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to find out what that was, you got to get the DVD. <laughs> right. I never heard that story before. No, me, me either. Um, in, in regards to his book, you can still get his book. I happened to dig up a copy. I happened to find recently... It's on Lulu.com, and it's not for an exorbitant price. If you look around, I guess, on eBay, you're gonna, it, it, the people are charging a lot for it. On Lulu, it was about 30 bucks, which okay. is about what it normally went for originally. All right. Um, so if you're looking for the book, that's where to go. But, yeah, I mean, uh, the ex and, and Seth, um, when I talked to him, said the, uh, the Norman Smith interview was, was one of the most memorable things because he said Smith was just very, very kind to him. And um, he um, he really liked talking to him, and 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 uh, Norman was very open to him, and very you know, and very generous with his time. And obviously, you know, Seth has that lengthy part um, on on as an extra on the DVD. But there's also a lot of extras on the DVD that did not make it into the main part of the film, mm -hmm. and um, so that's another reason to pick up the DVD. Because there, you know, there's the the main film, and then there's all these extras with these extra interviews that, for one reason or another, didn't work in the documentary in the frame of the documentary, but are 
just as nice and you know are equally as charming as some of the stuff in the in the uh, in the film. Why don't we just so, run by a list of some of the names of the people who are interviewed? We can do that. Okay, I have uh, Peter Noon, Graham Nash, okay. uh, Jackie DeShannon, who talks about what it was like to be on the plane with the Beatles when she toured with them, and she was always in the back of the plane. It's a story about um, teaching George Harrison a guitar riff for one of her songs. Uh, there's one interview here. I mean, this is one of those interviews that blew me away, the kind of person that you would never think would be interviewed. And I didn't know this guy's name. His name is Steve Kepner. And this guy was in the band Tin Tin. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who know the song, they had a, a top 20 hit here in America uh, back around 1971 or so called Toast and Marmalade for Tea, which was right. very Beatles-ish and very Bee Gees-ish. And that's because Morris Gibb produced them. And uh, there's a story about how because of his association with Morris, who lived right near Ringo, he spent some time with Ringo at his house. Mm -hmm. and actually watched the movie together with him, and Ringo made dinner for him. So right. it's just something like that. Who on earth would think, let's get a guy from Tintin <laughs> and interview him for this, for this film? Right. Yeah, that, that, was, that, was, that was very, uh, very down-home, you know, Ringo kind of down-home-ish right. story that um, was unusual. Um, and one, of the one, that, one of the ones that uh, got my attention was the Lucy Baines Johnson story. Hmm. Where she tells in a phone interview with with uh, Seth how she had asked her father, uh, President Lyndon Johnson, about having the Beatles at the White House, and he he said no. Which imagine what that would have been like. Um, but right. uh, that was another interesting story that uh, is in there. Well, um, a few other people that we should mention. Uh, mm -hmm. We got Brian Wilson in there, Ray Manzarek, right. Smokey Robinson, Rod Davis from the Quarrymen, uh, Victor Spinetti's in there, as I said, Ken Scott, the engineer, Justin Hayward, uh, Bernie Williams <laughs> from the Yankees. Right. And actually, a lot of people don't know this, but there's a story that Bernie tells, and it's, it's basically about meeting Paul McCartney and being excited and hugging him when he was uh, a little sweaty at the moment when Bernie was. But uh, a lot of people may not know this about Bernie Williams, who was center fielder for the Yankees, big all-star, great hitter. But he actually had a contract with Paul. Paul published his music because he's a really good guitar player. And he's also, Paul's also a big Yankees fan. That's true. Even though uh, you know, it was Shea Stadium that put together Flaming Pie Night, not Yankee Stadium. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And the Beatles played Shea, not Yankee Stadium. But that's right. another story. Tony Bramwell's in there. Klaus Vorman tells a really nice story about what it was like when he presented what became the front cover of Revolver, that design to the Beatles and their reaction to it. Bob Eubanks mm -hmm. is in there. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting story, too, of how, not, how uh, nice the Beatles treated him. He was the promoter for the Hollywood Bowl shows. Uh-huh. I got to tell you, though, um, one of the ones that really stood out for me was mm -hmm. Joey Molland. Because Joey talked about uh, during the sessions for Straight Up, I know he said this several times, and I've interviewed him a few times as well, where a lot of people have asked him who did the slide guitar on Day After Day, and Joey has consistently said that it was worked out between George and Pete Ham. And he talks about how they spent like six or seven hours working out that slide guitar part. But he also <laughs> says that he really made the band work on three-part harmony and to do it live, <laughs> three of them together. And they spent the whole day working on three-part harmony. He made them work really hard on that. And also because of George, Joey got to keep some of his songs on the album, because there were songs that he was thinking about throwing away, but George actually said, no, these are not bad songs at all. Right. So maybe if you like the songs from Joey that are on Straight Up that George produced, like Suitcase or uh, I Die Babe, that could very well be because George gave him the encouragement to, to keep working the song. And he helped him out with uh, some song lyrics and the arrangement, George did. So I thought right. that was really interesting. Art Garfunkel... I was just going to say the Art Garfunkel story um, where John uh, talked to him about getting back with his Paul versus 
Paul McCartney. Right. Uh, to, and that's that's a very interesting, very interesting moment um, for what it's worth. And also uh, Frank Gifford talking about uh, John meeting Ronald Reagan, um, which is also uh, interesting too, because hmm. um, uh, Frank Gifford was there um, when that happened. Um, and apparently. So, Reagan had explained American football to John. <laughs> well, yeah, Reagan. Reagan was a, a, a sportscaster in his earlier days. Yeah. So. Well, that's what Frank had said. Someone else who I thought that was really interesting interview is Denny Lane, because he talked about working with Paul right after John was killed, mm-hmm. and what Paul yeah. had said at that moment. I believe I really understand Paul extremely well because when you're going through something really traumatic what I tend to do is work <laughs> you know to try to take my mind off of it to be therapeutic right. in some way and that's exactly what Paul tried to do and if I remember he had worked on the song Rain Clouds right after John had died but what he had said to Denny Lane was uh, I'm never going to fall out with anybody again because I guess at that moment he realized how precious life is. So, very powerful words right there. And right. something very ironic happened that day of uh, a van that pulled up in front of the studios. But I'll let people watch that to find out. Right. One of the few interviews that got noticed in advance of the DVD coming out was the, um, the one about... Um, Fred Seaman? Uh, with Fred Seaman, where he comes up with the theory that he thought John was becoming conservative, and which I've never believed. And in fact, I, you know, I brought this up to Seth, and I don't think John was. In the, I mean, that's Fred's idea, and he can, you know, he can think what he wants, but I don't think that's the case. And and uh, I mean, given the fact that that he and Yoko were so you know, we're so progressive. I really don't think that uh, John would ever, I mean, he could have gotten along, he could have gotten along with, with Ronald Reagan. I mean, that doesn't say that the two of them wouldn't have coexisted or would have, wouldn't have been able to talk civilly, but I really don't think that that meeting would have made uh, John turn conservative even a little. I, I, I just can't see that. Well, Fred um, said that um, he would have voted for Reagan. Because he had turned sour on Jimmy Carter, and he thought that Jimmy Carter was a phony. He also mentioned that apparently uh, Carter snubbed him at the inauguration. But I don't know. I still don't. I still have trouble buying that. I really so do. So do I. I mean, even May Pang has refuted that. Mm-hmm. So I really find it hard to believe. But, you know, John was a constantly evolving person, so there's no telling. But I just think that he was always, like you said, very progressive. Mm-hmm. Very liberal, you know, so it's it's really something that I don't buy. That's no. just me personally. Yeah, and I, I don't either. Um, but, you know, that's, and, and that did get a, you know, uh, that story just about went viral at the time. And, and it was like, you know, what are they, you know, there's just no proof of that at all. Mm. You know, so I, yeah, that's one thing. But that's Siemens, you know, thinking, and that's fine. But. I think the the uh, there's evidence a lot of evidence to to not prove that. But I mean, let's get back to the, back getting back to the movie though. The movie is is charming, and it does what a lot of unauthorized Beatle films don't do. Is it just you know it brings the charm of the group, and that's really what it's all about. Right. That's really what it's all about. There's so, no there's no particular agenda or motive in this. It's just getting a bunch of people together, all telling their own personal anecdotes about the Beatles. And there's so many people that had contact with one or more of them that never told their story, and it's nice to have it all in one package like this. I tell you, though, the only problem that I've had with this Mm -hmm. particular film is that, and I know what it's like having worked in radio for so many years, the most difficult part of the job when you're doing an interview is editing. (laughs) Because you may have a lot of really good bits and really good stories, and you've got to narrow it down. In this case, just about every single interview was maybe a minute. (laughs) So just imagine if he spent half an hour with each person, and he's got to pick the best bit, how difficult that must be. 
There's right. so much juicy stuff that I bet we'll never see. <laughs> so probably, yeah. And I some mean, of like, these some of these people who are heavyweights, like a Klaus Foreman, for example, uh, or a Joey Mullen, any of these people. Jack Douglas, you can easily, I can easily watch a half hour or an hour with any of those people. So when right. you're just getting one little snapshot, one minute, it's just, you feel like you want more. It took him, it took him eight years to do it. And he even left out his own personal Beatles stories. Which That's right. You had I, written something up on, on Beatles Examiner about that. You right, should tell everybody right. the George Harrison story. That's really very well, fascinating. There's two, there's two George Harrison stories. He met him twice, the first time through a friend, and he happened to go, he was, they were in a, re, he was in a restaurant where George was upstairs in a private room, and he went up and got introduced to him, and George says, oh yeah, here's Bobby, here's Tom, here's Roy, <laughs> here's Jeff. He was dining with what was to become the Traveling Wilburys, and Seth was there for that. And that was just, and it's not in the film. Um, if you look, um, if you go to, uh, Beatles, if you go to examiner.com and search for my name and search for Beatles stories or search for Seth Swirsky, you'll see the interview where I I put it, actually I separated them into two different stories, uh, into two different um, uh, parts, and he tells both of the, of the stories of meeting uh, George twice, Paul McCartney on a treadmill, and Ringo Starr. And they're really, really great stories. They really are. And I, you know, and it's funny that they're not in the film, but they would have made a great addition. And, and uh, I wonder why he didn't put it in the film. Because if he thought the film ran long, you could always make it a bonus track. Sure. I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, yeah, he, he he went over those stories with me, and and um, those are really those are really cool stories. They really are. Imagine what it must be like when you're told you're going to meet George Harrison, and you end up meaning all the traveling Wilburys. Right. I know. That's that's pretty pretty amazing. So. so just to sum things up, I think that this is really a worthwhile film and DVD to pick up. And if anything, I, I hope that Seth will continue to do more of this stuff because I think there's a hunger for this kind of thing. There's plenty of other people out there who I'm sure would be willing to do interviews just like this. Or he could even include some extra material from these interviews that he's done already. I would love right. to see something like that. I know that part of these were done at Beetlefest, which is interesting in itself that he went there. So, so we we definitely feel this is something that is worth picking up. It definitely is. I we think that big... yeah, every single level of Beetle fan would love this. Because mm -hmm. there's definitely. something for everybody in there. There really is. So if you would like to get in touch with us, we happen to have a brand new spanking email address. Why don't you tell the folks what it is, Steve? It's things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. Yeah, if you send us comments or comments at that address, we will get them. Okay, and um, each of us has our own Facebook page. If you want to get in touch with us that way, things we said today has our own Facebook page as well. And right. um, if you want to, you can check out my own website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. There's all sorts of interviews with people connected with the Beatles and lots of fun trivia posted every single week with great prizes that I give away as well. And uh, once again, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And if people want to explore your work, all they have to do is... Go to Examiner.com and search for my name, uh, Steve Marinucci. I'm actually... I have multiple Beatle columns, but... Um, if you look for Beatles Examiner, you'll find a lot of it. And um, So by all means, please get in touch with us through all those channels. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love feedback and even suggestions of what you'd like us to talk about. It's all about what's happening in the Beatle world these days. And as Steve knows, since he's writing every single day about this, there's all kinds of things happening. Oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> it's, it's It's kind of alarming. You'd never think about it, but... You, you may not realize it, but if you go to Beatles Examiner, there's news posted every single day. And I really, you know, I, I really try to stay on top of what's happening now as opposed to things that aren't happening. I mean, things that are older. However, I did do a, a neat little story about uh, a, a project I'd had in mind for a long time called George Harrison's Greatest Bits that I actually did several years ago where I dug up um, using... Um, 
the Beatles undercover book, uh, some of uh, the guest appearances to Rod Harrison made on various CDs. Ah. And there's some wonderful, wonderful songs that probably a lot of people don't know about. And I started doing that. Uh, I did the first one of those the other day, and it got a great reaction because the two tracks that I picked, that I mentioned were just fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's a whole other world, too. I mean, you not only have the Beatles group recordings and the solo recordings, but all their side projects, there's quite a lot there to delve into, mm-hmm. and especially where George is concerned. Right. Yeah, I know. And those particular ones, are. Uh, I mean, his guitar work is just so great, and he would add a, a, de- a definite dimension to anything that he helped out in. And um, so those tracks are just tremendous. They really are. Mm. So check that out on the George Harrison Examiner, that article that Steve go. wrote. There you go. So thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, this is Ken Michaels along with Steve Marinucci saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. See you next time.